Yeah, just to give you a little background on Avicenna. So we're a, an early stage company. We've been around for a couple of years and we've come up with a very uh, unusual novel uh, optical interconnect for chip-to-chip -chip communications. Um, so um, we're targeting chip-to-chip -chip applications with this uh, very novel, highly parallel optical interconnect. If you're an optical interconnects person, you'll know that uh, this is a very unusual approach. In fact, this uh, slide originally was going to be called Light Bundle has a very weird solution. Um, so interconnect power and density are increasingly dominating compute system performance. Um, and we provide a solution that achieves 10x better or more uh, improvements in power and density. The one caveat is that we can only go up to about 10 meters in length as opposed to uh, many optical interconnects you're used to thinking of going much farther. But it, there's a large class of interesting applications that uh, where 10 meters is just fine. So we, instead of having a few lanes, we have hundreds or thousands of parallel optical lanes, each going at one to 10 gigabits per second. So if you do the math and that, you can get multiple terabits per second in kind of a one millimeter uh, type fiber. Um, and so the dramatic improvements in power density uh, and latency, so power less than half a picojoule per bit. Uh, density, uh, aerial density can achieve better than 10 terabits per second per square millimeter or two terabits per second per linear millimeter, kind of shoreline density. And latency is fairly minimal, um, so just a few clock cycles for through our interconnect plus the speed of light. So how do we do this? Um, so we do something very unusual, which is we've uh, developed an, um, an optimized gallium nitride micro LED that can be modulated up to 10 gigabits per second. These things operate in the blue. And this technology comes from the lighting industry and uh, in the near future in the, for displays. Uh, you'll be seeing them in smart watches and, and, and phones and things like that in the next few years. So we're leveraging something that's ramping to very light, high volumes. Um, at this blue wavelength, silicon photodetectors are great. So you can monolithically integrate uh, these photodetectors into CMOS um, and that works, um, uh, it has very low capacitance per unit area. The one very weird thing we do is we use a fiber, instead of having one core, it has hundreds or thousands of cores. So we call this bunch of cores fiber, kind of with a, a nod to bunch of wires uh, that's being done in ODSA. Um, and this is fiber that's derived from uh, uh, industrial and medical imaging. It can be done in glass or plastic, and it turns out that it's a very convenient way to shove a lot of data through a, uh, through a fiber. Um, and as I noted, kind of terabit per second uh, or, or more data rates through a single fiber. Very important point here is optical uh, interconnects and optical transceivers typically are limited by, in cost, is dominated by packaging and very tight alignment tolerances to single mode fiber. We're working with uh, cores that are in the order of tens of microns, 50 microns is a typical number. So you're looking at alignment tolerances on the order of plus or minus five microns or more, and that allows you to use passive positioning and packaging uh, costs decrease dramatically. So one question is, how do we achieve such lower power dissipation? Uh, how do we do 10x better than what people are doing with pretty much any other um, solution in this space? So back when I was in grad school, um, which is a long time ago, um, we, we knew that uh, optical interconnects, even very short optical interconnects, had the potential to be very low power, but there was never a practical way to implement them. And the, this benefit was based largely on the fact that you can make them very small, kind of 10 by 10 microns. And so you get kind of 10 femtofarad types of capacitance, so CV squared power is, is extremely low. By using LEDs, we don't have a threshold to these devices, unlike Vixels or other lasers. So you can operate them at much less than one milliamp. Um, and uh, the other thing, when you think about integrating this interconnect with the chips that you're trying to interconnect is you can get them very close to the chips. In fact, you can monolithically integrate these right onto the IC in the future. Um, in the meantime, for people to get more comfortable with it, we can make a chiplet transceiver that will be integrated uh, with, let's say, a GPU, memory, whatever, within a multi-chip package. 
Um, I might also add that no extra functions are needed, so we don't need, we're not doing a bunch of uh, multiplexing to high speeds. Our raw error rates are quite good, less than 10 to the minus 12, so we don't need FEC either. Um, and the same, the same improvements then also allow us to achieve this very low latency since we're not doing a lot of uh, extra processing in the electronics. So this is an example, just a little bit of data from a few different links. So first of all, we've been able to modulate uh, individual lanes up to 10 gigabits per second. So on the left here, you see a 10 gigabit per second I. Um, and on the right, you see kind of a standard waterfall curve, bit error rate versus received power. Um, the limitation of 10 meters comes from dispersion. So we're using uh, highly multi-mode fiber, and our optical sources have a wide line width. So both chromatic and modal dispersion limit us to about 10 meters at a four gigabit per second data rate. Um, so, um, and then another important point is this gallium nitride material is kind of, uh, it's very robust compared to what uh, indium phosphide and gallium arsenide that people are used to working with in optical communications. It's very insensitive to temperature. So these curves show that going from minus 40 degrees C up to 150 degrees C, you're seeing kind of a two to three X difference in the output power, but it, with a laser, it, it would look vastly different. So we can operate these things, we can put them right next to hot chips, operating at 100 degrees C or so, and uh, they, they work quite well. The other thing is that we've been doing some reliability testing. It's fairly early, but we have, uh, I think at this point, up to about 7,000 hours. These curves are a little bit stale. Um, and the reliability is looking quite good. Um, it's not really a, it's not that much of a surprise. Blue gallium nitride is used in lightings. In lighting, it's uh, used in blue lasers at pretty high current densities as well. So it's a pretty robust material. So one of the most exciting things about this innovation is not just that it achieves high performance, but that it leverages existing high volume ecosystems. So I mentioned gallium nitride lighting industry, all of your LED lights are based on gallium nitride. Uh, I also mentioned that the biggest consumer companies like Apple and Samsung are developing displays based on this technology. And so we're able to leverage all of that. For instance, in a gallium nitride uh, display using micro LEDs, you can transfer the devices on a, from a, sub, a uh, substrate on which they're grown, for instance, sapphire, and do a mass transfer of thousands, tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands, even millions to a CMOS backplane. In our case, you can think of our interconnect as actually being a very low res display that has a few hundred pixels, but you, where you're turning the pixels on and off at 10 gigabits per second instead of at 30 or 60 frames per second. But the, the key here is we can leverage this whole, this huge uh, volume ecosystem for low cost and be able to scale to high volumes without having to develop uh, um, a whole new bunch of industries. So where are we? So we've uh, we fabricated a proto ASIC. Um, because we operate at fairly modest speeds, in this case, two or four gigabits per second, we were able to use this inexpensive 130 nanometer CMOS technology for validation. And so this, uh, this chip has up to 256 lanes at two gigabits per second. So that's 512 gigabits per second, just for this first proto. Um, and we're currently developing a uh, what will what is intended to be a real product, which uses a more advanced node, 16 nanometer uh, TSMC, and it has about 300 lanes and change times four gigabits per second. So that's a 1.2 terabit per second interconnect, and uh, we're working with supply chain volume uh, uh, partners on volume manufacturing of all key components. So to wrap it up. Uh, highly parallel optical links with huge improvements in power and density and very low cost potential, you know, um, cause you to ask a question, will in the future this technology make its way onto high volume GPU, CPUs, and memory if it is able to scale to high volumes? Thank you. Yeah, so we've gone up to 10 gigabits per second per lane so far. Um, it might be able to go a bit higher, but these things are probably not going to go to 
uh, you know, 32 or 50 gigabits per second. We're depending on spontaneous emission, not stimulated emission, so they will not be as fast as lasers. But you can see with these densities uh, that we can get to, you know, very high throughputs. It, it's just the the um, yeah the speed of the carriers in the device are such that it's hard to get a lot faster. Maybe 20, but not much farther. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.